First of all, Shavua Tov. Uh, was reading Parshat Tulma today. Uh, and I, I think one thing that is interesting to note about the list of items that are given in Parshat Tulma, which describes the ingredients for and the construction of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, uh, the central and complexly assembled, you could call it an edifice, uh, although maybe, you know, a tent or a collection of objects with a sort of tent structure um, and altars and all of that. But so the tabernacle at the center of the temple, um, describes all the different components and ingredients for the tabernacle. And uh, they, they come in groups generally. So uh, starting with um, the Pasuk where we, we, Give the name to the parasha. Vezot atruma asher tikhumi tam zahav bechesibu nechoshet. So you should take this offering, this truma, um, and you should take from them gold and silver and, and bronze. So that's like a, a first set, three metals, right? We're in the metals category, and there's three of them. Utchelet v'argeman v'tolat shani v'shesh v'aizim. So now it's blue and royal purple and crimson uh, kinds of fabric. Um, and it also mentions shesh ve'izim. So um, uh, in in this translation, it says fine linen and goat's hair. Um, and then ve'orot elim madamim ve'orot hashim ve'atseishitim. So we have, and then the skins of rams, and then the skins of goats, and then it just mentions atzei shitim, so wood of the shitim variety. Then it just mentions shemen lamaor, oil for the light, and then it goes on besamim la shemen hamishcha v'liktoret hasamim. So again, it's like now it's spices for this and for that. So we're back to lists of things. And then it's Avne Shoham, the Avne Miloim, Lefod La Hoshen. So Lefod Vela Hoshen. So we have onyx stones and uh, stones to be set in the Efod and also in the Hoshen of Ishpat. So again, it's a grouping of stones. I and mean, we know, in fact, it's even more stones um, than are, are listed explicitly here, but it even divides it into okay, there's for the Efod and for the Hoshen. And then it all ends. So they should make me a sanctuary and I will dwell among them. So everything I just listed, like going through again, rapid fire in English, gold and silver and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet, fine linen and goat's hair, ram skins and tahash skins. Um, and we'll skip over the ones that I'm going to focus on. Spices for the anointing oil and for the incense. Onyx stones for the ephod and for the hoshen. And of course, it's a list of spices, in fact. And it's a list of stones, in fact. Um, and, and then we're done. And it's and they should make me a, a sanctuary and I will dwell among them. So in the middle of all of this, of this list, where we have these, these collections, these lists of things, list of metals, a list of skins, a list of the, you know, where nothing is just by itself. There are two things that are by themselves, seemingly. And they're consecutive. And that's the atse shitim, the shitim wood, which is going to be used for something. And then also the shemen lamaor, the oil for the lamp. And what's interesting about that is that if you notice that all the other groupings are the same kind of thing, but of different sorts, you know, different kinds of skins, different kinds of metals, different kinds of spices, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we look at Atsei Shitim and Shemen Amaor, what's the commonality there if this should be a grouping? Like, if we don't want to break the pattern, because these things are also consecutive, they're both trees, right? I mean, we don't notice that at first because we're talking about wood in one case and oil in the other case, but it's not just any oil, right? It's Shemen Zait. It's, it's olive oil, so it's from an olive tree. And then obviously the Atsei Shitim, you know, the, the wood from the shitim tree, which Rashi says is the Erez, so the, the cedar. 
um, that that starts to have some traction. Now we're talking about okay, this is the other grouping. The grouping is of of trees, and that's a particularly interesting point when you notice elsewhere in the Torah that we're explicitly forbidden from planting a tree uh, on Harabayit now, but like you know where where the Mishkan is, right? That. The, the, it's referred to in, in, in that prohibition elsewhere, I think, in, in Sefer Zvarim as an asherah, like a sort of a, a tree for the purpose of religious worship or, or, or something like that, a holy tree. Um, we are not allowed to have an asherah. And so really there's kind of a problem with having a tree there. Like if 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 we were reading this list and, and the Torah said... Oh, and you also should plant some kind of tree, whatever kind of tree it is, and put it there. That wouldn't seem, you know, out of place in the sense that it's just like a list of instructions of how to assemble a thing. But we know from elsewhere in the Torah that we're explicitly forbidden from planting a tree. Uh, and, and that maybe kind of correlates here a little bit with the way that the presence of a tree or a pair of trees here at the center of this list is, is being kind of submerged a little bit uh that with everything else it's clear we're talking about metals now we're talking about spices now we're talking about stones and then here we're talking about trees but it doesn't say oh we're going to give you a list of trees it says well there's like the wood for the the aron you know and then there's the the oil um in in the other case um and i i think that um we now have to ask like what what is the Mishkan trying to do with the concept of a tree if we're forbidden from really planting a tree there and it's kind of not reminding you or, you know, it's sort of breaking the pattern a little bit by not reminding you that the olive oil really is, is from the tree set and that we're talking about a grouping of things that come from trees uh, here in the middle of the list. And why is that kind of, you know, uncomfortable or problematic? Uh, and... Yeah, I, I think you can make a simple, a relatively simple suggestion of of, of something that um, is interesting to think about here, which is what is at the center of the Mishkan? Um, what is in the sort of most inner sanctum uh, of the Mishkan, which is the Kodesh Kodashim? Um, it's the Aron Hakodesh, the or the Aron Habrit, the the Ark of the Covenant, or the the Holy Ark which is going to be made of this atseshi team. It's going to be made of this wood, which will then be covered with gold leaf. And what's on top of the ark and what's on the curtains, you know, et cetera, that are surrounding this Kodesh Kodeshim, it's keruvim. It's cherubs, you know, which is, keruvim is a, a Tanakhic word, which, you know, we can connect with the idea perhaps of, of malachim, but a keruv is a keruv, and whatever, a, a keruv is whatever Tanakh says a keruv is, but it's some kind of creature, seemingly, which is first mentioned when, when Adam and Chava are being thrown out of Gan Eden, and Akadosh Baruch Hu puts Hakeruv there, Lishmo Derech Etz Chaim, right? That the the, the Kiruv is there with Lahat Acherev Hamit Hapet, Lahat Acherev Hamit Hapechet, the fiery turning sword, or however you want to translate that to guard or to keep the way of the tree of life or the way to the tree of life. So there is a tree connected with the Kiruv, right? The Kiruv represents the idea of the way to Etzachayim, the tree of life. And we put the Kiruvim all around Kodesh Kodeshim and on top of this box that we never open that's in the center of Kodesh Kodeshim. So there is a strong sense, in fact, in which there's a notion of a tree that is cryptically being referenced as being central to the whole idea of the Mishkan and what it's doing. And that's at the Chaim. But the point is, we're not allowed to plant a tree there and be like, look, there's at the Chaim. And it's a poplar tree or it's an orange tree or whatever it is. Um, instead, we have to construct the idea of at the Chaim from the different symbolic elements that the Mishkan is providing us with with, I would argue, both different trees that are being referenced here. Um, because 
we can't get the idea of it's a Chaim basically from an actual tree that it's possible to plant there. And instead, if, if you want to reference the idea of it's a Chaim, you need to compose it from what we get from the way we're using the Atzei Shittim, the, the Erez tree, uh, the, the cedar tree that's being used to make the Aron on the one hand, um, uh, this box, this, this ark, um, and on the other hand, what we get from the other tree, which is the olive tree. So, so what, what, what do I mean by that? Um, so I, I think the point here uh, is this, that when we're talking about the cedar aspect, and this cedar aspect, it's not just really from Rashi, it's being relayed from the Tanhuma through Rashi, um, and and it's it's part of a statement about Yaakov Avinu that he brought, um, uh, he brought the cedar tree, prophetically to Mitzrayim to be grown there, so that there could be cedars that would be brought out of Mitzrayim when Bnei Israel left, so that they'd be able to make um, Aron Abrit uh, in the desert, because presumably there were no cedar trees in the desert, just growing naturally there. Um, so so what? What are the properties of 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 the the eras of the cedar tree that are, are relevant here? All the different connotations we can bring in. Well, for one thing, it's like the tree that we think of as being the very tall and mighty tree. You know, Arzea Lebanon, the tree, the cedars of Lebanon. They're these very tall, mighty evergreens, and so they're you know always green and they grow really tall and 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 they seem like they are in a sense the the mightiest living organism in the world, right? And and they might have been tempting as some kind of primitive symbol of a tree of life, right? Because tall trees are old trees that last a long time. Um, and there are other species of evergreen, in fact, that really are some of the oldest trees in the world, like redwoods, you know. So cedars aren't redwoods, but they are, uh, in the concept of Tanakh, a tall and mighty tree. And what do we say about the, the Arazim? Um, in in Tehilim, for example, we have the Basu Kol Adonai Shover Arazim Vaishaber Adonai et Arzea Lebanon. Right? The voice of Hashem smashes cedars, and Hashem will break the cedars of Lebanon. So the the idea of the cedar here is that it's been cut down, right? It's a dead tree. It's not a living tree that we planted, you know, in the Mishkan or next to the Mishkan. It's a it's a mighty tree that was laid low or laid low, um, and uh, has been chopped into boards and now has been made into a box. So that's one thing. It's just the 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 idea of it's a Chaim, We need to construct by negation by taking a kind of tree that we have here in the world and saying. Well, what this tree reminds us of is that Akadosh Baruch Hu is greater than everything, even the mightiest and longest living and biggest things in the world that we know. Akadosh Baruch Hu can just knock them down. Um, and, and so we have that to remind us that like the path to Etz Chaim involves recognizing Akadosh Baruch Hu's supremacy um, because this box where the Kirovim are sitting is made of this tree. And so this is about the path to the tree of life. Um, uh, this this Aron that's at the center of, of Kodesh Kodeshim. And, and then also you have actually in an interesting way um, elsewhere in Tanakh, you know, the idea uh, with the Arazim that they, they involve um, the cooperation of friendly nations in the construction of the Mikdash because the cedars the cedar wood, you know, that is found to the north of, of Eretz Israel, in Sor, for example, in Tyre, that was sent by King Hiram, who's a friend of David and Shlomo, and those cedars became part of the, the house of cedar that, that Shlomo built uh, for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And so the cedar also connotes very strongly this idea that at the end of the day, you know, if we're going to the, to the secret at the center of the Mishkan uh, and 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 going into the Kodesh of Kodeshim and going there as though we're retracing the path to the, the tree of life in Gan Eden, you know, these are themes that have to be very universal because although Yahadut and Torah is a 
a, a call to, to service and to worship for a particular people that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has designated a particular role for as a mamlechet kwanim, as a, as a nation of priests, the ultimate, let's say, footing of that nation is supposed to be facing outward towards the world and uh, bringing to all of humanity the opportunity to have relationship with Hashem and and, and to uh, to learn about what he wants to teach humanity through what he you know, the, the Torah that he's he's given to Am Yisrael, and so that theme has to be at the center of the Mishkan, and there it is because what we have is that the the cedars you know the, the Arazim um, that uh, were used to build the the Beit uh, of Shlomo, it's explicitly about friendship friendship with a uh, a foreign nation that has the right kavana, the right attitude that they want to contribute to creating um, uh, a mikdash where Hashem can be served, uh, and that when that relationship you know functions properly, that there's a very positive and universal aspect to Abu um, Hashem uh, because it's about bringing all of humanity. Uh, to know Hashem and to to worship Him as well, and and to be able to do it in Yerushalayim, um, in the Mikdash uh, that we create there. So that theme also is there about you know the 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 path to the Tree of Life. That it's Chaim. It goes all the way back to Gan Eden, which is again about this sort of universal heritage of humanity that we share, going back to Adam and Chava. Uh, and I, I don't find that to be an accidental connotation either that's coming in and really must in some sense be uh, the part of what's being referenced um, uh, in, in in this uh, midrash that we have that's associating the Atse Shittim with, with Erez, with, with the cedars. So now we've talked about the cedars and now we want to get over to the Zayt, the, the, the olive tree. So Shemin Lamaor the oil for the light, for the lamp, that also is about a tree that is not standing, right? It's You're not, again, planting an olive tree in the Mishkan. You are plucking part of the olive tree off and smashing it up and sort of uh, grinding it into a paste and squeezing the oil out of it. So, again, there's something very um, destructive. Uh, and and so it's it's consistent with this theme that if we're going to reference the idea of it's a chayim, then we can't do that with some type of standing living tree here on earth. We have to do it by negation at some level. Um, but then what is the essence of what we get from um, Shemin? It's, it's, I mean, th this part doesn't require a lot of explication. It's light. It's about, uh, there's something, uh, again, coming back to this theme that we were just discussing, like what uh, is... At the end of the day, you know, like the, the path back to Gan Eden, the path to the tree of life, uh, which HaKadosh uh, uh, Baruch Hu is trying to show us, it's about lighting the lamps in the Mikdash so that we can light the way, not just for Am Yisrael, but for all of humanity. Um, and, and and be, as Yeshayahu and Navi puts it, like the, the, the light for um the nations and, and so uh the the composite image of the portion of what we get from the cedar and the portion of what we get from the olive together is evoking a tree that we can't actually put into the mishkan physically because we don't have an et chaim to plant there but it is uh powerfully referencing this idea of you know, telling you a bit about what the tree of life is 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 like, basically, because it's there with the kiruvim. It's about derech, it's a chayim, and we're being told that the tree of life is about the supremacy of Hashem. It's about inviting all of humanity to know Hashem, um, and and doing that through friendship and collaboration and creating a, a mikdash for Hakadosh Baruch Hu to dwell in and to sort of come be with us in. And it's about the light um, that we light there, so that you know people can see the way. Uh, and and it's it begins with the light that we light um, uh, that that the koanim that Aaron 
are lighting in the Migdash, but it ultimately has a an audience that extends, you know, to all of humanity. Uh, and the last thing I'll just say, you know, which maybe is the most commonly observed thing about all of this, um, is, is that clearly when we talk about Etz Chaim, you know, when we take the Torah out of the uh, Aron that we we keep it in in a, in a Bet Knesset now, it's commonly the case that people will sing Etz Chaim Chila Machzikimba. And they're quoting a pasuk from Mishle, um, which I think actually requires a little bit of effort to read this way because the, the, that passage in Mishle is a lot about chokhmah and um, it's not obviously and explicitly referring to Torah specifically when it says etz chaim hi, but it is traditionally interpreted to mean that you know when we're saying it's chaim chila machizikimba that it is a tree of life to those who grab hold of it, we're talking about the Torah um, in in the language of Mishlei and of, so of Shlomo Melech, um, and uh, if that's the case, if the Torah is it's chaim, then it makes sense also that we have all these kiruvim that are sort of guarding the way to the tree of life, which is at the center of the Mishkan. That what's there in this box made of the wood. Um, and you know, in a Mishkan illuminated by the light from the other tree that's that's been involved in creating this. Um it, it's uh, although it should be acknowledged that in Kodesh Kodeshim it's actually dark, and so the, the this this light is going outward to the rest of the world, to the rest of humanity, and it's not actually in order to to, to cast light um into the Kodesh Kodeshim, because that's this very enclosed place that has a, a different um purpose but inside this box which we don't open right what's what's inside Aron Abrit? it's Luchot Abrit. it's the whole tablets and the smash tablets so you have this stone tablet emblem of the Torah given at Sinai that's at the center of this whole construction that's surrounded by all these Kiruvim that are guarding it and so that does confirm the notion that the Torah is is its Chaim but I, I think I'll close by just observing that there's an aspect of this that maybe isn't so much emphasized, which is that um, there's even perhaps an element in the contents of the Aron that explain a little bit better um, what we mean uh, by the Torah being an, an Etz Chaim, because it's not just the broken tablets, and it's not just the whole tablets. It's both of them that are in Aron Abrit. Um, because Moshe sm smashed a first version and another one had to be hewn. And so I, I think when thinking in terms of life and a tree, you suddenly see these stone tablets, the fact that they can be both broken and whole and held in one place, that ev that evokes an almost cyclical and living kind of connotation, right? That there's a there's a sense of, what makes the Torah an Eitz Chaim, a tree of life, is that we have to go through these successive cycles of thinking we know what Hashem wants us to do and relating, therefore, to His commandments as though they're like given by His hand to us, written on stone, like unchangeable, totally unambiguous, divinely decreed, and then we have to go and follow our instructions but it turns out when you go and do that, what happens? You go off the rails and your, your misapprehension or your limited understanding of what Hashem wants leads, even to, for people with the best of intentions, to the slippery slope down to idolatry, which is what happens when B'nai Israel are you know, trying to concretize their idea of who Hashem is and they build the golden calf uh, as a result. And that leads to Moshe smashing the first set of tablets and then you can make a new set of tablets, right? So instead of thinking, okay, there's a correct way if you follow these instructions, but if you you know deviate, then you're going to end up doing the wrong thing, and then Hashem will punish you, and you you should just always be worrying about uh, a, staying perfectly correct because, um, in a sense, that task is clearly defined, and it's just a matter of your willpower to do so. We can go from that kind of view to, a, I would argue, a, a more realistic one in which it's acknowledged that even with the best intentions, our limited capacity to understand will always cause 
there to be a risk of idolatry, even in sincere attempts to serve Hashem. Um, and that means that we actually need to kind of go through this living process, this the cyclical process of destruction and renewal that, that, that sounds much more kind of ecological in nature, uh, where you start with some tablets, you go do what you think is right, you get you get it partly right, you get it partly wrong, and you're sort of, you know, wrapped on the knuckles for the idolatry that that led to. And then you have to kind of shatter those tablets and get a new set. And of course, they, they had the same thing written on them. So it's not about changing the, 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 the wording of the Torah, but it is about reforging one's relationship uh, to what's written in the Torah. And, and I think that that uh, living cyclicality is an emblem at the center of this whole structure that we call the Mishkan. Uh, and that really is, in some sense, the this is a very uh, uh, in, in, inappropriate um, metaphor to say the beating heart, because trees don't have hearts, but it is, in a sense, like the, the, the beating heart of the tree of life uh, that we are uh, constructing through our different uses of tree products um, in, the, in the construction of the Mishkan. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.